Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Just checking, you can still hear me at the back. Yes, I've got my microphone all wired up and plugged in. Good, well, um, thank you for coming out this evening. And uh, again, unfortunately, on a, on a very traffic heavy and rainy night, but um, good to see so many got here. Um, we, we managed okay. Um, so thank you very much, as always, to the School of Mathematics and Physics here at Queen's for helping us put these on. It's, uh, it's always great to have their help and uh, appreciate it very much. Now, I'm gonna, just going to talk about a few things. This is World Space Week, and this is our lecture for World Space Week. Tonight, there's a few other um, events going on, um, mostly down in the south. They seem to have taken to it more than us, but we, we do a little bit here for it with this, this lecture tonight. Just going to talk through some admin, then we'll have a little bit of a look at the night sky, and then we'll move on to our, our main speaker. So, some admin -y bits, bits and pieces. Um, Membership, for those who haven't paid up yet, it's fantastic value at £20 for an individual, £25 for a family. That's a price that's been held for many years now. And if you, if you want to sign up again tonight, if you talk to Brian on the end there, there's Brian, a membership secretary, he'll, uh, he'll sort you out there. And you get um, lots of benefits, including our, our fabulous magazine, Stardust, which comes through your post. And talking of which, you should have had that. Those of you who paid up should have had your Stardust in the last few days or so and it's, a, it's another terrific issue thanks to Andy for that well done always always a good read which I enjoy except for the bits I write but that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy those as well <laughs> as well if you want to find out sort of more about things going on and what we're doing then there's a lot of information on our website irishastro.org um, and there's a link through there to the uh, the observing on the forum as well and also there's a link to a compilation of Terry's news bulletins, which are full of all sorts of information. And if you don't get Terry's news bulletin, t talk to Terry down here. Everyone knows Terry. Um, and just uh, put your name on his list, because that bulletin is full of a wealth of information and stuff. Um, we also have a Facebook group that's quite successful. Um, it's got about 900 members um, in there. And uh, again, there's a lot of information comes through on that as well. And it's uh, um, full of good crack and stuff. So. So have a look on Facebook for us. The observing nights, we, we had a, a very successful observing night uh, a week or so ago. Did we get a second one? Do we have it? No? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we had, we've had two already, you see, and the, which is a bit of an improvement on uh, things because last year the weather was so bad that we missed quite a lot of them, which is a bit of a shame. But uh, things seem to be working out for us a little bit better this season. Um, the observing nights, the format is that um, we pick a Friday or Saturday um, there's a selection of dates, and um, I've, I've sort of changed the table that I had there last time, which was unreadable on the projector, but that, that is quite readable. The next one's coming up October 20th and 21st, and if we don't get a, a clear night out of the Friday or Saturday there, then we move on to the next weekend, 27th, 28th. And that's all kind of built around not having too much of the moon in the way. Sometimes there is a, a thin crescent moon or a first quarter to get us started off, but really with observing um, to see most things, particularly with um, not much in the way of planets and stuff in the sky at the moment, um, that then what you want is a dark sky with a moon out of the way. And uh, that's those, those dates are picked around that. Um, and keep an eye on the forum, which is linked from our website, and that tells you whether you know, we're, we're calling it as a, as a go for good weather or, or a no-go if the weather's that bad that we can't do it. So that's all the information you need to, to know there, um, very successful night, so very good. A um, few things upcoming. Um, our next lecture here in two weeks' time is Dr. Laura Keefe from Inspire Space, talking about space law, um, owning stars, mining asteroids, and Asgardia. Find out what that's all about. Um, come down in two weeks' time to hear, um, and that would be Dr. Laura Keefe. Uh, there's a whole bunch of good talks going on at the Mayo Dark Sky Festival down in County Mayo, um, 27th, 29th of October. Um, great lineup of speakers. Um, those of you who are down here uh, to see Professor Mike Burton, who's now running things at Amar Observatory and Planetarium, he's one of the speakers there, um, and many others too. And that website, Mayo Dark Sky Festival, is, is linked from the left column of the front page of our website, irishastro.org. So if you go there, there's a link through to it. Um, that's good. And um, we're having another astrophotography exhibition. This, this, this time, the Heavens Above exhibition is moving to um, Carrickfergus Museum in the Civic Centre in Carrickfergus. 
and that will be launching on the actually launching on the evening of the 10th and we're doing a sort of a weekend of activities um, around that there so um, more more information on that when we've we finalized that um, one one small other thing I was just asked to mention that um, our youngest member who's not here tonight um, Hayden Garrity he's off to the European Space Agency in the Netherlands at the weekend um, where we'll be meeting more astronauts and given he's seven he's actually met more astronauts already than I have at the age of 56 so there you go so uh, you're doing very well Hayden Find my place again now. Okay, we're going to talk about uh, a little bit of sky. I'll turn the lights down so we can kind of see what's going on. Um, now then, you know, um, we talked last time about um, Solar Cycle 24 a little bit, and, um, and I did just speculate slightly that um, the way the sun was on the 5th of September, here with these two huge sunspot groups that were exploding and throwing out um, coronal mass ejections and so on, um, that they might come round again 25 days later, and they have, but, 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 but in very much diminished form. This was Sunday when I did this thing that, uh, there that, um, that's, so that's 26 days later or something like that. They've come to a similar position on the sun, but they're much diminished and spread out over a much smaller area and sort of more round and not really doing very much at all. So, um, but it is proof that the same sunspots do come round again, again sometimes. It is just a convention of things as well that they always get a new number. They don't stick with that number there. So they've, they've come back this time as 2682 and 2683, um, but they are fading away into something or other now. And you see from the, the stats on this that um, this year so far, 20% of days have had no um, sunspots at all. And that brings us back to to where we were sort of um, six or seven or eight years ago um, when we were at the minimum before solar cycle 24 picked up. So it seems to be very much on the way out now, cycle 24. However, that doesn't mean that nothing's been happening. And there's, um, there's a little bit of an aurora which, which happened on the 30th of September. And that's from Amanda Ruddick up on the Orkney Islands. But as you see, that's quite low, not very intense. I mean, here's the plough here, so it's not it's not high up at all. It's, um, it would be nice to see, but, um, but we haven't, uh, I don't think, um, missed out terribly there by being just that bit further south. So that's um, sort of solar things. One of the other things, of course, that makes observing the, uh, the aurora a little more difficult is that we are, we've got a fairly full moon at the moment, and that's just one I took out the other evening. That was the same evening as the aurora there, 30th of September, and... Um, just for a bit of fun, I've sort of um, ramped up the colour a bit on that, and you do get some... It, it is real colour. The moon has genuine colours about it. It's not... When you actually watch the Apollo things, they sort of said it was completely grey. And that's really not... When you turn the, you know, the, the colour sensitivity up a little bit, it's not really true. Um, there are distinct blue areas, particularly um, the Sea of Tranquility type area there, where that's where Apollo 11 landed, just there. Um, and that shows a definite blue tinge to it, which is indicative of titanium. Um, and there are some sort of orangey, red, rusty areas um, around, and, and they, they indicate iron. So there's, there's rich mining opportunities on the moon if we ever get to sort of building things there. Um, other things there, there's Tycho. Uh, my favourite, Crater, Clavius. I always use it in the Stardome shows, Clavius, just to show... Um, an idea of scale, because Clavius there is the same size as Northern Ireland, approximately. So that is to say that if you, if you were here in Belfast in your car and you drove west for two hours, you'd end up in Enniskillen or something there. So it's, uh, it would take you a lot longer to get your car there in the first place, of course. Um, so that's the moon. I've got another moon picture from one of our members that was sent to me that's even more interesting than that. Uh, John Purvis got this the other evening. He's been reading my article in... Uh, in Stardust that, that covers how to do this, and he's done this one and I haven't. But, uh, um, so this here is the moon, um, very low in the sky because this is um, just after 7 p.m., and this is the early part of the International Space Station coming past here. Um, and it is one of those where the space station is in sunlight at the time. Um, so he's, he's used one thousandth of a second exposures with a, um, a ZWO CMOS camera and a 900 millimeter scope and uh, has caught the, the ISS brilliantly there. Um, that's, that's what it is. Um, it, the ISS and the moon, if you think about this, are the same distance away from the sun. That is to say about 93 million miles or so. Um, and it's an in indication that the shiny metal of the space station is 
more reflective than the, than the fairly dark moon. In fact, the moon, the moon, even its bright bit, is about as dark as coal. It's extraordinary um, reflectivity-wise. So the ISS always shows up on top of the moon. So that's a, another moon picture. Just to talk about the planets a bit, um, I, mean, I suppose the short summary would be you need to get up in the morning to see the planets at the moment. Um, Mercury did have a nice little apparition recently, uh, but that's now sinking down towards the sun again, and you won't catch that uh, unless you're very, very lucky um, at the moment. Um, Venus is also sinking down towards the sun, and for the next two mornings, it is passing Mars in the sky. So actually, the next two mornings, and believe it or not, you wouldn't think so at the moment, but tomorrow morning's weather forecast looks pretty reasonable, in fact. Um, that if you want to get up at sort of six o'clock in the morning or so, um, you will see Venus easily and very close to it with a pair of binoculars, maybe you'll see Mars. Um, for the next two mornings, tomorrow and Friday morning, um, they will be less than one moon diameter apart, apparently in the sky. Not really, they'll be along a lot further than that apart. In reality, it's just a line of sight thing. Um, but that's, that's how they'll look. Um, very nice for the next two mornings. Jupiter is disappearing now setting pretty much with the sun, and you, because of the angle of the ecliptic, you won't see it. It's, it's very, very flat like that um, at sunset. Um, Saturn, likewise, is low down. You might catch Saturn for a few weeks, maybe more, but it's, it's low in the southwest. Um, Uranus, if you've got your star charts and your, um, and your binoculars, you'll be able to find Uranus reasonably easy um, in Pisces, sort of later on in the evening. It's, it's um, once you've got a, a sort of planetarium thing to tell you where it is, or something, it's, a, it's a faint green blob, I'm afraid, is as good as it gets, but uh, um, you can actually find it quite easily. And likewise, Neptune, which is a little bit further to the right in Aquarius. Um, and um, if you do that, it's quite easy to then get to the point where you've seen all the planets, um, because ever since they demoted Pluto, it became much, much easier to see all the planets. And um, International Space Station... There's some great parties of that happening. We saw John Purvis's catch of it there. Um, and um, until the 14th of October, you'll be able to see uh, the International Space Station. And if you have a look um, at heavensabove.com, or there's a link directly on our website, um, on the left-hand side of our front page, there's a thing called Quick Links, and in there is a link called ISS Passes. And the thing about that that's handy is you don't need to put your, link, your location in that one because that takes you straight to Belfast. So... Uh, ISS, don't forget to wave at the guys there looking out the window, looking at you, so have a little tootle around bits of the sky. One of my favourite bits of the sky that's prominent this time of the year is, is, is the area of the Summer Triangle, and that's made up of these three stars here, Deneb, Vega, Alta, very, very obvious, quite high up in the sky early in the evening, uh, and it's actually got the Milky Way, that's that faint blue patch running right the way through it, and it's got lots of little things in it that are of interest as well. Um, not marked there, but one of my favourite objects just to the left of Deneb is the North America Nebula. Um, you can't see it, or at least I, I'm told there are people who can see it, um, but I've, I have never naked eye seen the North American Nebula, but it does show up nicely on cameras, particularly ones that are any good at red sensitivity. If you have a modified camera that's sensitive to red, the North American Nebula shows up very beautifully, and it's just to the left of Deneb there. Um, other things that are worth looking at, M27, Messier 27 is a lovely planetary nebula there, and a much smaller, similar nebula is M57 that's over below uh, Vega here. Um, and other things there, there's a globular cluster, M71, um, and a lot to see in that area. Over to the right, here we have Hercules, and two globulars in Hercules, M13, which is probably the, the, was the most famous northern hemisphere globular cluster, it's full of stars, and the, um, and the somewhat neglected M92 that's nearly as good, but because it's nearly in the same place, um, seems to be just much less famous for some reason. But, uh, the best globulars are in the southern hemisphere, I'm sorry to tell you. So we'll have a move on from there. Just sort of moving over to the left as you look at it in the sky. Um, great square of Pegasus here. Um, these four bright stars, if you look sort of um, southeast early in the evening, you'll recognize that square. And it's quite easy to do a little bit of uh, um, sort of 
star hopping here. You look at the square here and you take the two top stars of the square and you memorize that distance in the sky. Then you come back to the top left and go the same distance again, having taken a bit of a right turn. And that takes you up to a bright star, Merak. And then you stop there and look to 90 degrees away from the path you were on before. And there's another star called Mu Andromeda there. And you go the same distance again. There's this fuzzy patch here that you can see with the naked eye. And that's the Andromeda galaxy. That's light from two and a half or so million years ago um, coming there. And that is the furthest away thing you can see with the naked eye, the Andromeda galaxy. So that's uh, but there. The big W of Cassiopeia is up above that. Um, and you can use half of Cassiopeia, this part, half of the V here, to, to give you a pointer down towards where the Andromeda galaxy is as well. So that's, that's another part of the sky you can see there. Just some pictures, straightforward little pictures of some of the things I've described there to give you an idea what they look like through a small telescope. Um, that's everybody's favourite star. Um, Alberio, Beta Cygni, um, at the bottom end of Cygnus, is a double star with one sapphire blue component and one gold yellowish component. And it looks really nice, even if, even a small telescope like a Skylux or something um, that's powerful enough to, to resolve that nicely. Messier 27, as seen in the original series of Star Trek, I believe, um, is, is a wonderful planetary nebula. It needs a camera to bring it out, but uh, it's not that dark, so it can, can quite easily be caught. Uh, Messier 13, Globular Cluster, you see why people get excited about those. It's full of stars. Um, and a, an easy shot, just with a, that was taken with a camera lens um, on, a, on, a, on a mount. Um, of um, Messier 31. I've got a better Messier 31 coming up, actually, because one, one of our members has been hard at it with his telescope. In fact, here it is. Adam Jeffers from Cookstown has been uh, taking some fabulous photos recently, and that's his look at um, Messier 31 with Mes the satellite ga ga galaxies Messier 110 and Messier 32 here. And um, the structure in that is absolutely fabulous. And... Um, uh, it's, and you are looking at a galaxy pretty much like ours, um, a long, long way away. That light has been travelling to us for two and a half million years. Um, the consequence of which is um, that's the only proof we have that it was there two and a half million years ago. Um, we're not entirely sure that it's the same or in the same place. Now, there's no reason to think that it's that different, but there will be things that have changed in that time. Um, there will have been explosions and all sorts, all the same stuff we get in our own galaxy. Um, so that, that was as it was two and a half million years ago, which is the most up-to-date picture I can bring you. Um, just a little bit away from where Messier 31 is, in fact, in the sky, if you, go, if you look at the directions I gave you to, to the Andromeda galaxy, you go back to the bright star Merak and go the same distance again the other side of it, and you come to Messier 33, the Triangulum galaxy, and, uh, and that's notoriously hard to photograph. Um, I've tried several times and I've got nothing like that. So that's a really brilliant job by Adam there. Um, I, I can sort of get the middle of it, but he's got spiral arm detail right out here. And that's very, very good as well. So keep at it, Adam. Keep them coming. Just, I put this in for people like me who get up early in the morning. Um, and actually, actually, the sky in the morning is better than the one in the evening at the moment. Um, if you get up at 6 o'clock in the morning um, and look... Um, to the south, you will see Orion, the best constellation. Um, and Orion, of course, is, a, is seen as a hunter, and so you've got, um, you've got his head up here, shoulders, belt. Somebody said to me the other day, Orion's belt is a waste in space. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I said, that's a terrible joke, only three stars. <laughs> um, so this is, this is Orion here with his shoulders and his belt and his sword down there with the nebula in. And Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, you find that by following his belt downwards or you follow his belt upwards. And you come to Aldebaran in Taurus, Aldebaran, the Hyades, and past that, Messier 45, the Seven Sisters, of which there are probably many more than seven, as we know. In fact, we know there's more than seven because I'll show you a picture. Adam, again, has been photographing... Messier 45, and th these are the sort of, the, you know, the, there's the five there that you see, and then maybe one or two there um, would be the normal set. Some people can see more. Some people can see 10 or 11 stars. 
look through a telescope and you see there's hundreds of them. And uh, this is a brilliant picture as well, because it's, it's, it, these are really sort of held together stars. And um, they are in a nebula of clouds, and um, that cloud is illuminated by the stars, and Adam's really caught quite a bit of that here in the, in the nebula. So that's terrific too. So anyway, that's plenty to look forward to. I'll uh, leave you to go out and get up early one morning and start looking at that, or what you can do if you wait till February, then you can see all that in the evening anyway. Um, so that's what we'll do now. I'm going to introduce our guest. Um, our guest speaker today is uh, Dr. Sophie Murray. She's originally from Nace, County Kildare, um, and she obtained a BA in Physics and Astrophysics at Trinity College Dublin, where she's still at as a research fellow, um, and an MSc in Space Science at University College London, um, then went on to do a PhD in astrophysics research, um, again at Trinity College Dublin, studying sunspot evolution with vector magnetic field observations from the high-node spacecraft in order to better understand solar flare processes, which is great stuff because that's what she'll be talking to us about tonight. So also from 2013 to 2016, Dr. Murray worked as a space weather research scientist at the Met Office in Exeter in England. Um, that's the National Meteorological Service for the United Kingdom, and uh, transitioned basic service to operational space weather forecasting, which is very important stuff, as no doubt she'll tell us in her talk, Cloudy with a Chance of Flares, the Importance of Space Weather Forecasting. Dr. Sophie Murray. <laughs> <laughs> 